All right, in today's lesson, we're going to talk about how ATP is resynthesized aerobically. We'll talk about enzymes and how they're utilized to, to help synthesize ATP. And we'll also talk about the different types of pathways that we have. So first off, let's talk about how enzymes facilitate bioenergetics. So in the first part of this semester, we discussed how ATP is required to resynthesize or to power exercise. So you use the ATP to, to do your active myosin cross bridging, uh, to even out ion gradients. Now, <clears throat> most of our ATP is going to be consumed here in the myofibrils with the myosin and the actin and some right here in the membrane with maintaining the ion gradients. We have, for aerobic metabolism, we're gonna use the mitochondria, little organelles or machinery inside of, the, inside of the cell to resynthesize ATP. This is where aerobic metabolism occurs. Anaerobic metabolism, on the other hand, is gonna occur out here around the muscle cell, not separate from the muscles. Whereas aerobic is in its own little compartment, anaerobic is right in there. Now you have two populations of mitochondria. One population are called subsarcolemmal and the other is intermyofibrillar. So intermyofibrillar, they're right here in between all the muscle fibers, right next to where the, the ATP is going to be needed for contraction. On the other hand, you've got these subsarcolemmal that are just around the periphery of the muscle cell. And these are going to be used uh, to synthesize ATP to maintain ion gradients. Now there's gonna be overlap in, in where the ATP is going. Some from uh, intermyofibular might go to the membrane and some from the subsarcolemmal might go to a, a myofiber. But, but this idea of placement helps you understand why, why you would have these placed there. So what is bioenergetics? Uh, specifically is the process of taking energy that we have in our food and converting it into ATP, or at least using it to make ATP, I should say. So uh, let me use an analogy here. So you have your cell phone battery, right? You probably took, put it on the charger last night, took it off today, and, and it was completely charged. Well, where's that energy come from? Most of the energy that we get here in Provo is coming from these coal power plants somewhere south of here. Um, that the coal power plants, they burn coal uh, to spin a magnet and it causes electricity to go through the power lines and eventually reach uh, your, uh, your cell phone battery. Even though we're making the, the, the electricity with the coal, no part of the coal ever goes inside of your battery right? I can't, also, I can't put the coal up to the next of your cell phone battery and expect the cell phone to get energy from it. There's a lot of steps and processes involved in getting the energy that's in the coal to go into your cell phone battery, or using the energy from coal to charge your battery, I should say. So we, we consume food, uh, we have our fat, our carbohydrates, and our proteins, and you know we eat these and it helps power us through the day. But fat and carbs and protein, they're not converted into ATP. We're not ripping an ATP off of a fat or anything like that. What we're doing is we're burning the fat. We're burning the carbs, essentially. And from the energy released from burning them, we shove ADP and, a and the phosphate back together to make ATP. So no part of your fat becomes ATP. No part of your carbs becomes ATP. They're completely separate. And there are many, many steps involved in, you, in harvesting the energy in your carbohydrates, fats, and proteins, and using that energy to shove ATP back together. And those steps require enzymes. It doesn't just happen naturally. You're not just gonna eventually get by accident the carbohydrates to release energy and have that energy channeled into making ATP. It doesn't, it could happen, but the chances of it happening are so ridiculously low that it's just not going to happen. And so we have enzymes. Enzymes are little machines that make 
uh, chemical reactions like the chemical reactions needed to go from carb to get the energy out of carbs to resynthesize ATP, these enzymes make those chemical reactions happen much, much, much faster. Now, they're not causing the reaction. They're not, uh, they're not making two things react that normally wouldn't. They just make it happen faster. So let me give you an example here. So this is a diagram of glycolysis. And you're going to get extremely familiar with this simplified diagram uh, by the end of the semester. But this, what this illustrates is the process of going from glucose down to pyruvate. And in that process, you're going to release energy to shove ATP back together. Now, there are many steps here. And every one of these little air, these gray arrows represents an enzyme or a, a machine, little machine that's putting two chemicals together. For example, when one of the first steps that happens in getting in glycolysis and getting the energy out of glucose, you go from a glucose, six carbon glucose, and it has to hook up with a phosphate from an ATP to then become glucose six phosphate. So you can see the only difference between this starting substrate and the end product is now you got a phosphate on top of it. Now, it, without any enzymes, it's possible that the phosphate could get could fall off of the ATP and end up on the glucose, but it's not going to happen very rapidly and it's not very likely. The enzymes make the glucose and the ATP hook up much more rapidly. So let's assume that this is glucose, this is ATP. They, they're, they're a perfect fit for each other, right? Uh, the phosphate will hook off of the glucose and hook off of the ATP and go onto the glucose. It's, it happens on its own. Uh, but just like, imagine these are like little puzzle pieces. You have to get them in the right orientation at the right time in the right spot. Imagine like having a uh, putting two, putting puzzle pieces, a hundred piece puzzle in a box and shaking it and, and having the puzzle pieces come out uh, made, it's just not going to happen. In theory, it could, but it's not. It's not going to happen. Uh, to get the right orientation, it takes a lot of time. So what enzymes do is they put the puzzle pieces, the substrates in the right order. They're almost like a magnet where they pull them in in the right direction so that the substrates nat naturally hook up and form the desired product. Uh, another way to think about enzymes is to think about speed dating. So some of you probably are on like Tinder or Mutual or whatever app you, you might be on. For Farmers Only was one I saw recently. You should check it out. Um, these apps, these speed dating apps, their goal is not to make people who are not compatible get married. Uh, their goal is to get people who are compatible to meet up, right? So hopefully you, you're not going to like go on a date with someone from Tinder that you just think is absolutely atrocious, right? These apps, they're, they're designed to get you to interact with more and more people and speed up the, the matching process. You might run into Mr. Wright or Mrs. Wright uh, on, on campus walking to the Cougar Heat or something, but it takes a while, right? Uh, there's a lot of people you have to sift through and it takes a long time going to ward prayer or to all these other things and and activities and dates, uh, speed dating, Tinder, mutual, they just let you flip through people really fast and find people you're compatible with. They don't change the reaction. It's not gonna force you to marry someone that you're not compatible with. This is the same thing with enzymes. They don't make things interact that wouldn't normally interact. They just make it happen faster. And, and because of that, we can go from glucose to pyruvate or lactate in a split second because of these enzymes. If we waited for it to happen on its own, we might be waiting years for it to happen. So enzymes make these processes happen so much faster that it can sustain life. Without your enzymes, you're not gonna live, right? And so throughout this semester, you're gonna learn about these different enzymes and what their jobs are and how their, how their speed is influenced uh, in glycolysis. And we'll focus a little bit later today on the electron transport chain. And these complexes, complex one, two, three, four, five, that we're going to talk about, they're actually made up of many different enzymes just pushed together to make like a super machine. And they're going to take energy from one spot to another, products from one spot to another, and, and help get the desired outcome. Now, one thing that you might notice from electron transport chain 
is that we're moving electrons. We're going to take electrons from something called NADH, put it onto complex one, and then these electrons are passed from one spot to the next, to the next, and ultimately to oxygen that accepts it to become water. So for our resynthesis of ATP, we're really passing electrons down uh, across uh, energy gradients. What's kind of cool is that during glycolysis, uh, we're breaking down the carbohydrate and burning it in different ways so that we can form these high energy NADHs with these electrons that are in a high energy state. And then those NADHs are going to go to the electron transport chain and be passed down and release energy on the way. These reactions where you're passing electrons are, oh, I jumped way ahead. They're called oxidation reduction reactions. And, and all it is, is you take an electron from one molecule and give it to the other. The, the molecule that receives the electron is called it's reduced. The, the molecule that loses the electron is oxidized. Um, and so it's a lot like, like a bucket. So in our a bucket brigade with water, in our, in our bodies, we have something called NAD and FAD. I'll show you those in a second, but NAD. And it, it's like a, an electron carrier. It's going to, right now as NAD, it doesn't have extra electrons. But once it gets filled with extra, extra electrons, it becomes NADH. Uh, so the bucket here would be like NAD, and then this big old garbage can that's getting the, all the water now, and now that it has the water, it would be NADH, or assuming that it's electrons, it's NADH with electrons, okay? Uh, so we have these electron carriers that are going to, to transfer electrons from one place to another. Uh, and <clears throat> so this is what they look like. NAD plus is the, the electron bucket. One of the electron buckets or carriers minus the elect extra electron. But once you get the extra electron, it comes with a hydrogen or two. And, and now, now it becomes NADH. And that NADH has an extra electron it can donate somewhere else. Uh, FAD is also an, an electron carrier. And when it gets its extra electrons, it becomes FADH2. So it gets electrons and some hydrogens there. But these are going to have high energy that can be used to, to cause reactions to occur. Uh, but with the, without enzymes getting the, without enzymes getting the electron from, from one carrier to the next or one molecule to the next isn't going to happen very naturally. So we need these enzymes to make all these steps happen. So as I mentioned before, what enzymes do is they, they speed up how quickly things will interact. Now, <clears throat> uh, you can have exergonic reactions that release energy. And enzymes aren't going to change how much energy is released by the reaction. But what it does change is how much energy has to be invested uh, to release it. Right, so it decreases the activation energy, makes it easier. Uh, it doesn't change the products, you get the same products, but it makes it easier. Now, we have all these enzymes throughout our body that are responsible for, uh, uh, for processing glucose so we can get ATP, uh, for uh, synthesizing hormones, all sorts of enzymes, they're all over the place. Now, the, the enzymes that are involved with our bioenergetics they are influenced by several different things, their activity, and one of them is temperature. So remember, the, the enzymes, they count on the, the different substrates or the different parts coming and hooking up with them. Under cold temperatures, things aren't moving around as fast. The molecules probably that need to interact probably aren't moving as fast or moving like this. And, and so the likelihood of them interacting with the enzyme is lower. And so the activity or how much product an enzyme can make per second is low at cold temperatures. But when you get close to body temperature, which is right around 37 degrees Celsius, uh, you have the, ends, the, the molecules moving around. The heat causes them to move around a lot faster and interact with the enzyme. And so you get the enzyme interacting with the, the molecules and producing the product at a higher rate. Now, one really nice thing for us is that most of the enzymes involved in bioenergetics uh, speed up when we, 
when we get hotter with exercise. So you go from 37 degrees to 39, 40 degrees in your blood uh, with very intense exercise. And that increase in temperature will make all the enzymes that we're gonna talk today about, well, most of them, make them speed up and do their job even faster because it's increasing the likelihood of those little molecules interacting with the enzyme and therefore you can make the product faster. But what happens if you get too hot? This is something we'll talk about towards the end of the semester. If you get too hot, now the heat is going to mess with the enzyme and denature the proteins associated with the enzyme or basically burn or break the enzyme. So now the machine is busted and you're not gonna produce as much product. So we're really lucky, hopefully, I think by design, uh, that our, in, our body temperature is right around the optimal spot for these enzymes. Now, other factors can influence enzyme activity. Uh, one of them is pH. Uh, so as you, as you notice, the activity uh, of our enzymes is, is near peak uh, at our physiological pH. Your blood right now is probably about 7.4. When you exercise, it might get a little more acidic and go down to like seven, maybe 6.9 if you're you crazy. Um, but so we, we maintain in this optimum region. But if we get start to get too acidic, we can interfere with the function of these enzymes and actually slow down uh, the processes involved in bioenergetics. Now, fortunately for us, most of the enzymes are at a near optimal range in and physiological pH and the pHs that we'd see in, in normal exercise. But if you get to some pathological conditions where the, they get way too acidic or way too basic, you could decrease the function of these enzymes and really impair your performance. And we're gonna see some examples of that in a couple of days. So we already talked about redox, redox reactions. All right, so that's where we're gonna cut it for now. So enzymes just make things easier. And without these enzymes, you would not be able to process your foodstuffs into usable energy. Uh, even more than that, without enzymes, you wouldn't be able to live. So from here on in the next video, we're gonna talk about the difference between aerobic and anaerobic metabolism.